thought it was time to relax after all these troubles. And then comes upon him the problem of Yosef. What does that mean? What does the bar mean when they say that? Ratzah Yaakov Leisha Yishalva Kapatz Alav Rov Dosho Yosef. What? What? Is it tit for tat? Is it, did he do something wrong? Is that what it means? Like he deserved to? He wanted to relax after all his troubles, and that's why. I don't know, but let's say there's something here. Ah, okay. On the wrong page. Page one. He has about uh, eight topics. Ready? One is the explanation of the argument between Yosef and his brothers. Whatever that means. Next. Uh, the decree of God is truth and the working of mankind is falsehood. And everything is caused by God. Now that is them's fighting words. Right? Them's fighting words. You, you hear what I said? Mm -hmm. Yes. Tell me out. Topic? Yeah, about his brothers. God's decree is truth, everyone else's work is falsehood, and everything is caused by God. Mm -hmm. Then he says, Who was the man who told Yosef where to go after find, to find his brothers? Well, obviously. Who, what do you mean, obviously? What do you mean by that? I think you say obviously. It, it means it isn't a matter you remember now. Why? Because it's our understanding. Better. Who's our? What do you mean? Um, um, me too. So. When, the, when, the, when, the, when you read the text and it says, I and wish. he met a man, yes. and the man, and he asked the man a question, and the man told him an answer, do you say that this must be an angel? Yeah, because every, everything is, is very rare, very curious is why this man is alone with him and meeting with him and directing him to do something special so we have to think that it's, it's beyond our understanding mm -hmm. I see right? I see so uh, uh, otherwise could be a man or a man uh, with ch chatting talking to him what are you doing here um, no, socializing. There is no socializing. There is like a point, no. directly something. So Eliyahu has a suggestion that there's a little bit of an indication in the text and the way the story is told that he's a special man, not a regular person. And did you hear what he said? Um, not quite. He said, the way the story is told, Yosef is wandering, looking for his brothers. Mm -hmm. He didn't find them there. And it says, where are my brothers? What do you see? No. Um, he said, the Torah says, go, his father said to him, to find out how his brothers are doing, bring me back uh, some news. And he sends them from Hebron, and he comes to Shechem. Right? So, which is, first of all, a little difficult, because 
Yisrael, his father sent him to Shechem. He heard, he knew that the boys went to Shechem to do the sh the, 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 the he shepherd. Said, at least they yeah. go to Shechem. Yeah, yeah. Right? yeah. Yisrael, to wonder, um, Yisrael no. says to Yosef, uh, uh, behold, your brothers are shepherding their flocks in Shechem. In Shechem. Let did, me send you to them. And he says, I'm ready to go. Why did, why did he send them to Shechem if they had such a hard time in Shechem? Isn't that very peculiar, right? Yeah. <laughs> why send them to Shechem when we know that not too long ago they had a lot of trouble in Shechem? Right, exactly. Yes. And, and if, if anybody is wandering around there who's related to this family, the Shechem people might want to kill him. Exactly. So that's strange. <clears throat> but let's go on. We, so that you have to set that aside because we're talking about the man or the angel. Just a moment. Right. right? And it says here, and a man by Yitzayehu Ish, a man finds him. Now, and he is wandering in the field. And the man asks him, what are you looking for? Yeah. Now, that's a peculiar way to say the story. If it's just a man, right? So a man finds him. As though the man is looking for him. I mean, by Yitzayehuish, he is looking for something, Yosef. Mm -hmm. A man finds him. What do you mean by Yitzayehuish? You could say uh, he meets a man. You know, it's Yosef who's wandering around. And he happens to meet a man. So you would say that in the story. You would say... I was lost, I didn't know what I was doing, and I found the person and I asked him my question. Here, Yosef doesn't find the person, the person finds him, and Yosef doesn't say to the man, can, I, can you help me, I don't know what to find something. The man asks him, what are you looking for, sir? Right? So there is a little bit, that's one of the reasons why some of the textual and analysts say that this suggests that there's something going on here that's mysterious. It's not just a happenstance meeting with somebody. Yeah, because otherwise right? my, uh, if my I got student. lost, I would usually say, I see a person, you know, far away. I go after him and I say, hey, you, you, could you, you live here? Could you, could you tell me something or another, right? I mean, here, <coughs> he's wandering around. He's not, he's not looking for anybody. A man finds him. Steve. Like, where did he come from? I mean, uh, right? Well, That's one of the reasons why some people say this is a, something of a, of a heavy story. There's something more than just a, a random meeting with a person. Right, because the uh, other question could be, uh, where are you going? Where are you sailing? Yeah. You know, a, a sort of questions. Well, yeah. well, Yosef looks, obviously, he's looking like, uh, you know, he doesn't, he's looking for his brothers. Mm -hmm. He doesn't see his brothers. He's wondering, he's going like this. And he said, maybe I'll go over this hill. And he's looking, hey, they're not over there. So he comes back over this hill and he's looking over there. I mean, it's clear, it's clear to somebody who sees Yosef that this man is having a trouble. Because you can't find, he's not just walking down the road with a package and he's about to sell something. So you're wondering what he's selling. No, no, he's looking like a man who's bewildered, who's not able to do what he wanted to do. So you don't know what he's doing, but. So I understand why somebody would ask him, what are you, what are you looking for? But the, but the meeting of the person meeting him, rather than him meeting the person, is a little bit strange, right? Yeah. And he says, I'm looking for my brother. Mm -hmm. Another problem. Does Yosef have any reason to believe that he, this man would know what he's talking about? Mm -hmm. I'm looking for my brothers. You know my brothers? Uh, you stranger. You know my brothers? I mean, uh, he's gone to Shechem from Hebron. And he says, somebody asked him, what are you looking for? He said, my brothers. So what am I supposed to do to help you find your brothers? I mean, brothers? Well, who? They, he might ask them, what do your brothers look like? Uh, yeah. uh, what is their name? How many brothers did you do? Uh -huh. are you looking for? Uh, what were they doing, these brothers, that you're looking for? I mean, you yeah. want me to identify? So, so usually Yosef would say to somebody, Come you know, listen, you're asking me what I'm looking for? I'm looking for a bunch of men, 10, it so happens, 10 men, who happen to be my brothers, and, they're, and they have a lot of flocks of sheep. Did you see anything like that? He doesn't say that. Mm -hmm. he, it's, oh, as though, it's as though he assumes, he assumes this man who wants. found him, asks him what he wants, and he says, I'm looking for my brothers. And he says, Hagida nali eifo heim roim. Tell me where they are shepherding. Now, how would this man know where they're shepherding? Why would he suggest 
So, again, the, the close reading of the text suggests that there's something Yosef expects this man who just came out of nowhere to bring him some kind of guidance. Right. And that's what, again, I mean, so I, I don't say it's obvious it's an, it's an angel, but the, peop, the reason some of the Mepharshim see something mysterious under the text here, sort of going on here, not the usual meeting of a man, is suggested by some of the hints in the Pasuk, right? To say, obviously, it's an angel, who knows what, right? I mean, but, and Vayomer Ha'ish, and the man says, Nasu Mizel, they, they went away from here, Kishamati, because I heard them say, let's go Doitaina, he even knows the town, right? I heard them say, that, let's go to that town. Now, what are the chances of the man knowing that he's looking for that particular group and having overheard a conversation, there's a there's ten men with flocks, and there's a man, some man, and he hears them speaking to each other and says, oh, there's no grass over here, let's go to Doitan. Well, what are the chances of that? Mm -hmm. You know, and then he happens to meet this guy and asks him what he's doing, he says, I'm looking for my brothers. Oh, that must be the people that I heard say, hey, go time, you go there, you find them. Right? A little bit too but much coincidental, too strange. It was uh, Yosef must have felt up to the very fact that his father sent him to his brothers who he knows uh, to hate, hate him. That's enough. Um, to, 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 um, there wasn't anything surprising. Right. There are a lot of surprises. Yes. One of the Mepharshim, who says, I'm looking for my brothers, suggests that Yosef was hoping to make reconciliation. To reconciliation, that they would see that he's left home and he's come to, they went to shepherding and Yosef didn't. What's Yosef doing at home? So they probably didn't even want him, you know, I mean, let's, we're going shepherding. And they go, so he's left at home and he mopes and he sees, I mean, you know, they're not, we're not friendly. There's something wrong here, right? So when his father says it, he said, go to your brothers. Some of us say, Yosef, Yaakov was hoping, I mean, why does he need to hear news from, from the 10 people who went? He's going to send one person to find out how they are, so he's going to bring them back news. I mean, okay, maybe it's possible, but some people say that Yaakov knew that the boys didn't get along together. So he says, go to your brothers and bring me these things, yeah. right? To hang out with them a little bit. It, might, it might do some good, right? And he says that the Chayanim of Akesh, they went, of course, thinking that they're going to get rid of him, but he was hoping that he's going to make some kind of reconciliation. Okay. Say, All right? I say they, they went to Shechem to make a moon and to pray for the plagues. <laughs> okay. So... So he, he talks about who is this man, right? Mm -hmm. He claims it's Gabriel, mm -hmm. whom God sent. Um, and did the brothers know about the snakes in the, in the pit? Well, okay. Remember, they put him in a pit. And Reuben said to him, why kill him? Put him in the pit, right? So if they know that there's snakes and scorpions there, putting him in the pit is the same as killing him, no? So Ramban thinks that they probably did not know that there were snakes and scorpions. They thought it was the pit. So he'll be there alone, you know what I mean? But not that they would kill him by putting yeah, him in the pit. What is the reason to put him in, into the sea and know... That's Ruben's motivation. But why do they agree? What's the idea? So he says, don't you spill his blood. I mean, he's going to die. We're, we're, I'm with you. I'm with you, Ruben is suggesting, right? Uh, he, we should kill our brothers. But well, I mean, to take our own hands and stab him to death is not, not polite. <laughs> let's, put him into, let's put him into the pit. You guys, you know, put him into the pit. He'll die there and you won't have to be the ones who actually <laughs> kill him. Right, so, in second degree. Yeah, it's a pretty cheap kind of excuse, right? Mm -hmm. But 
he has to pretend that he's with the brothers because otherwise they would uh, kill him or they would uh, not listen to him, right? So he wants to convince them in a way that they might go along with him. He has a secret motivation that he's going to come by later on after the brothers are gone. He's going to pull them out and he's going to save them, take them back to his brothers. It always says that, right? Mm -hmm. But it seems clear to the Ramban that, you know, there's a Midrash that this pit was full of snakes. So uh, why they say that, I don't know. We'll see in a minute. But yeah, because Reuben was expecting to, to find him after, after his death. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he obviously thought that could be for a moment, not forever. That it was safe. Exactly. There. Yeah. Right? So didn't I tell you once? Pinky, didn't I tell you once the opinion of the Orachayim? There's a Mefarish before we go to Ramban. The Ramban feels it's been possible. Eliyahu agrees with the Ramban. Impossible that they would know that this thing was writhing with snakes on the bottom of the pit because then Ruvain would not have suggested that they put him in the pit yeah. if he wants to save his life. Correct? Uh, Makes sense. Yes. So Orachaim suggests he has a different answer. He says Ruvain, the brothers didn't know, but Ruvain knew that there were pits full of snakes in this cup. So what do you mean? He's saving his life by taking them away from his hand and putting them in the snake's hand? Like what kind of a saving of a life? He says something very revolutionary. You ready to listen? This might make you fall off your chair. So hold on. Okay. Hold on tight. Reuven knows something about God. Right. He says, Reuven knows, that when God chooses a man, Let's say Yosef is this choice of God to be the leader of his brothers and to make food for, the, the, you know, to be a messenger of God, to bring food to Mitzrayim and to his brothers and everybody else. That's choice. God's man. Huh? But Reuben knows that if God has a man and he has a plan, He's gonna say it's a man plan, right? And human beings want to kill that man, right? You might think. God has a man, he chooses Moshe Rabbeinu, and somebody wants to kill Moshe Rabbeinu, he won't be able to kill him because God chose Moshe, right? Mm -hmm. God chooses Yosef, somebody wants to kill Yosef, it's not going to work, mm -hmm. right? They're not, they're not going to kill him. So what is he worried about? According to the Orachim, he believes that Yosef is God's chosen man. So why does he have to say to the brothers, don't kill him? If they try to take a knife and kill him, the knife would break, uh, you know, oh, he, he no would, he, his, tur his chest would turn into stone. No. Uh, whatever, he would talk them out of it. God wouldn't let this happen, right? But he is worried about it. He says, don't, don't, I have to stop them from doing this, put them in a pit. So, Ruvain knows, what does he know about God? That God may have a plan. Human beings who are free agents want to do something that God doesn't want them to do, they can do it. God will not stop them from doing it. About Moshe, for example, right? There's a Midrash. There's a Midrash that after he killed the Egyptian, they found out about the Egyptian. You know, the, so there's one Midrash that says that they caught him. They caught him, and they wanted to kill him because he killed the Egyptian officer, right? So they tried to kill him, and they took a sword, and they wanted to knock his head off. But his neck turned to stone, and the sword broke. When he saw that, he went away, and they couldn't do anything to him, so he ran away. There's one matter like that. The plain reading of the text is, Moshe heard, oh my goodness, they heard, they're going to hear in the king's palace, they're going to come and get me, and he runs away, and he's away from Mitzrayim. This Medrash puts that in as well, as though we need some kind of magical, right? According to the Orachim, that never would have happened. If they would have killed Moshe, so Moshe would have died. What about God's plan? God has many plans. So it won't be Moshe. It'll be Eliyahu. It'll be Pinky. I mean, you, you, there, God doesn't have enough. God doesn't have enough uh, messengers, enough uh, people. Yeah, could have even do it. Although that would have been a, a laughing stock. So I mean, you understand? So 
According to the Rorachayim, God's plan doesn't make it irrevocable. It's a plan subject to human beings, not, uh, you know. God doesn't have a plan that six million people should die. Six million people died because bad people wanted to kill six million people. Mm -hmm. So the Rorachayim has that principle. He says, however, Ruvay knew if I save him from the brother's life, I could put him in a pit where there's snakes. This is the big blockbuster of also of the Rorachayim. I could put him in the pit where snakes because, because, although God doesn't interfere to protect his plan when it comes to human beings who are free, when it comes to nature, he can control it. He, he could, he would. It's up to him, right? If God's plan is that Yosef should be the chosen one, I could put him in the snake with rattlesnakes in the bottom of the pit, and God will make it. The snakes won't kill him. Because nature is not free will like human beings, and nature is not evil, and God can control the nature and, and does control nature much more directly. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay, so I mean, so according to the Orachaim, there's no problem for Ruve knowing that there's snakes down there, because he would take the choice. Away from human beings, better to be with the snakes. Like the King David. Snakes are better than humans. Mm -hmm. Remember, <laughs> King David had to choose the three kings that the priests said to him. Oh, oh, yeah, take a punishment. The human mm -hmm. beings who come to war against you or a plague, right? Mm -hmm. Right, 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 right. That's one of the things they said. Right. I think there were three things, right? Enemies, a plague, and, and starvation. Okay, so, so, uh, so, but according to the Ramban, he doesn't say so. According to the Ramban, he says it could not be that there were snakes in there that they would know about it. And then he has a topic here, the importance of the name of every person. I don't know what that means. And then... Okay, then he's talking about Yehuda. Uh, that, that is a separate issue. Uh, so, what do you, which would you allow him to do? The Nechashim? You want to do the snakes? Oh. We can do the snakes. I, I, it depends how long it is. We'll see. Chabbeit. Pasuk Chabbeit. Lamed Zayin Chabbeit. 37, 22. And our Ramban is Reish Yud. Probably very short. You have Reish Yud? Reish Yud, the Pasuk, the Ine, or the Hat, no. How to stop the Bamas and Aids? They say. But he says here, Reish Yud. Reish Yud, Hat, Bait. Oh, so it starts actually a little earlier, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, so 22, yeah, verse 22. You have it in the yes, Rabban? Yes, yes. He says, uh, he said to them, you know, I really agree with your principle that we should kill him. Right? With your plan. I also hate him. Right? He started to be one of the boys. Right? But I wanted him to die at the hands of somebody else, not Valatem uh, Don't you kill somebody with your own hands. In other words, you could be a Hamas director from Turkey telling four or five people in the West Bank to go and shoot Jews from Turkey. You could be a Hamas director from Turkey telling four or five people in the West Bank to go and shoot a family and their children, but don't do it yourself. It's a very strange kind of su suggestion, right? Don't, it's, 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 God forbid that you yourself would actually do the stabbing, right? His, his intention was to save them, take them back to his father. And, and so the, the, the text is only telling you not what Ruben is thinking, but what he said. Mm -hmm. right? This is part of the story. We know what's in his mind behind the scenes, but they're telling you what he actually said to them, right? First, the Ramban is speculating. He first argued 
all kinds of other things. Don't kill him. Uh, I know you hate him. It's not nice. Uh, what he did with us, he, we're jealous of him. But after all, we are big people and we don't have to be jealous. And better that. All kinds of excuses, yes? Kemusha amar lahem. Halo divarte lahem lomar. Alti techtu ba'elei v'shom lo shumatem. How do we know that he tried to convince them not to hurt him? We, we just now said, let's put him in the pit. Don't you kill him, let's put him in the pit. That sounds like he is hoping he dies. Just like them, it's just that he, you know, don't dirty your hands with the blood. So the Ramban wants to prove to you. Very interesting proof. Later on, you think you remember? Later on in Mitzrayim, in Mitzrayim, when they get into trouble with Yosef, who's pretending to be this boss man, right? And he's going to put them all in prison, right? And because they were caught with this uh, silver becker and so on. Reuben says, you know, we're being punished now for the terrible things we did to our brother, right? Because now they take our brother from us now, and that must be. So he said, you know, brother, brother, we did once a terrible thing to our brother. That's why we're being punished. And Reuben pipes up and says, and I told you, you guys, that you shouldn't hurt that brother. Now, do we see in the text, is he lying? Do we see in the text in this parsha he says to him, don't hurt the brother at all? He didn't say that. He says, just, just don't call, don't, kill, don't spill the blood himself, but put him in the pit so he'll die. Right? I mean, so we know what's on his mind, but he, he cannot, you cannot lie to the people that you, that you actually, they were in the story with him, right? So if you want to blame the brothers, you didn't listen to me when I told you not to hurt the brothers. And he's saying that to the brothers. And if they know that he didn't say that, they would say, what are you talking about, you liar? You never said that. Us. So the Ramban is trying to prove to us from that episode in Mitzrayim that Reuven really had other discussions with them here in this point. Only when he saw that he was failing to, they were going to kill him or they were getting angry at him for saying things like that, don't kill him, he's, a, he's only a boy, or whatever, 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 you're big boys, don't, right? He was trying to excuse him for something or another, right? When that failed, then he came up with this plan, well, just don't kill him yourself, but put him in the pit, as a, as a desperation move. Mm. The Ramban is suggesting, right? That's the proof that he brings. Very interesting proof. It's a, it's a pretty good one, no? Mm. Right? So look, he and I told you not to sin against him at all, and you didn't listen to me. When he saw that they did not listen to him to leave him alone, Amar Lehem in Cain, Altri's good down there. If that's, you know, since I can't uh, convince you, at least don't kill him yourself. Put him in the pit. Okay. Okay. Velo Amar Damo. Ki hera etzmo shelo yomar Cain la'avato. Oh, that's a pretty interesting thing. You know what I said? What did he say? What did Ruben say? Ruben said, Altri's good down. Don't spill blood. He didn't say don't spill his blood, don't spill Yosef's blood, don't spill our brother's blood, because that sounds a little bit more sympathetic, right? Yeah, it don't, it's not seeming for you to, to spill blood. A stranger even, you know what I mean? So it would seem like he doesn't even want to mention to, to the brothers, he's pretending that he doesn't want to mention him as being their brother, he's not even mentioning that he cares about him as a person. It's just don't spill blood, almost like a chicken. I mean, don't spill blood, right? Right? So, right? Rak shaloi yu shofchim dam, just don't spill blood. Limeid otam she'in onesh agorein. Ke onesh ashofech dam beyadai. So he wanted to tell them somehow that it's a second degree murder, right? Mm -hmm. When you cause somebody's death, it's not the same as when you do it with your own blood. Vetan el abor azeh shavamidbar. And if you look at the text again also, what do you say? Uh, so they put him in the What do you mean? And the boar is there without water, right? Right. It's very deep. And so Reuben knows he's telling them, right? He won't be able to climb out of this pit. It's a big, deep pit. And it's in the desert, right? It's in the wilderness. 
if he's going to call out, ain't Moshe alone. Nobody's going to hear him. This is part of the way he's convincing the brothers, right? And he thought it was time to relax after all these troubles. And then comes upon him the problem of Yosef. What does that mean? Is that what I said? Is it? What is it? Is it uh, there? What does the Mara mean when they say that? I mean, Ratsa Yaakov Leshe Bishalvan, the Kapatz Alav, Rov Dosho, Yosef. What? What? Is it tit for tat? Is it, did he do something wrong? Is that what it means? Like he deserved to? He wanted to relax after all his troubles, and that's why. I don't know, but let's say there's something here. Ah, one. He has about uh, eight topics. You ready? One is the explanation of the argument between Yosef and his brothers. Whatever that means. Next. Uh, the decree of God is truth and the working of mankind is falsehood. And everything is caused by God. Now that is them's fighting words. Right? Them's fighting words. You, you hear what I said? Mm -hmm. Yes. Now yeah. Topic? Yeah, about his brothers. God's decree is truth, everyone else's work is falsehood, and everything is caused by God. Mm -hmm. Then he says, Who was the man who told Yosef where to go after find, to find his brothers? Well, obviously. Who, what do you mean, obviously? What do you mean by that? Hmm. Why does Pinky say obviously? He's, he's saying this is an, a message of the angel of Nile. Why? Because it's our understanding. That Who's our? What do you mean? I'm, I'm me too. So when, the, when, the, when, the, when you read the text and it says, I and wish. he met a man, yes. and the man, and he asked the man a question, and the man told him an answer, do you say that this must be an angel? Yeah, because ev everything is, is very rare, very curious. Is why this man is alone with him and meeting with him and directing him to do something special. So we have to think that it's, it's beyond our understanding. Mm -hmm. I see. Right? I see. So uh, uh, otherwise, could be a man or a man uh, was ch chatting, talking to him. What are you doing here? Um, you know, socializing. There is no socializing. There is like a point, you know, directing him to something. So Eliyahu has a suggestion that there's a little bit of an indication in the text and the way the story is told that he's a special man. Not a regular person. Mm -hmm. And did you hear what he said? Um, Not quite? No. He said, the way the story is told, Yosef is wandering, looking for his brothers. Mm -hmm. He didn't find them there. And it says, Where are my brothers? What do you see? No. Did that no. help you? Um, he said, the Torah says, go, his father said to, to find out how his brothers are doing, bring me back uh, some news, and he sends them from Hebron, and he comes to Shechem. Right? So, 
which is, first of all, a little difficult because Yisrael, his father sent him to Shechem. He heard, he knew that the boys went to Shechem to do the the, the, the he shepherding. Said, he said they yeah. go to Shechem. Yeah, but Yisrael go to wander. Uh, Yisrael no. says to Yosef, uh, "Behold, your brothers are shepherding their flocks in Shechem. In Shechem. Let where me is, send you to them." And he says, "I'm ready to go." Why did Why did you send them to Shechem? Isn't that very peculiar, right? Yeah. Why send him to Shechem when we know that not too long ago they had a lot of trouble in Shechem? Right, exactly. Yes. And, and if, if anybody is wandering around there who's related to this family, the Shechem people might want to kill him. Exactly. So that's strange. <clears throat> but let's go on. We, so that you have to set that aside because we're talking about the man or the angel. Just a moment. Right. right? And it says here, and a man by Yitzayehu Ish, a man finds him. Now, and he is wandering in the field. And the man asks him, what are you looking for? Now, that's a peculiar way to say the story. If it's just a man, right? So a man finds him. As though the man is looking for him. I mean, by he is looking for something, Yosef. A man finds him. What do you mean by Yitzayehuish? You could say uh, he meets a man. You know, it's Yosef who's wandering around, and he happens to meet a man. So you would say that in the story. You would say, I was lost. I didn't know what I was doing. And I found a person, and I asked him my question. Here, Yosef doesn't find the person. The person finds him. And Yosef doesn't say to the man, can, I, can you help me? I don't know what to find something. The man asks him, what are you looking for, sir? Right? So there is a little bit, that's one of the reasons why some of the textual and analysts say that this suggests that there's something going on here that's mysterious. It's not just a happenstance meeting with somebody. Yeah, because I right? my, uh, if I got school. lost, I would usually say, I see a person, you know, far away. I go after him and I say, hey, you, you, could you, you live here? Could you, could you tell me something or another, right? I mean, here... He's wandering around. He's not. He's not looking for anybody. A man finds him. Who do you see? Like where did he come from? I mean, uh, right? Well, That's one of the reasons why some people say this is a, something of a, of a heavy story. There's something more than just a, a random meeting with a person. Right. So the other question could be, uh, where are you going? Where are you sailing? Uh, no, I, I sort of questions. Well, yeah. well, Yosef looks obviously is looking like. Uh, he doesn't, he's looking for his brothers. Mm -hmm. He doesn't see his brothers. Mm -hmm. so he's wondering, he's going like this. And he said, maybe I'll go over this hill. And he's looking. Hey, they're not over there. So he comes back over this hill. And he's looking over there. I mean, it's clear, it's clear to somebody who sees Yosef that this man is having a trouble. Because he can't find, he's not just walking down the road with a package that he's about to sell something. So you're wondering what he's selling. No, no, he's looking like a man who's bewildered, who's, not able to do what he wanted to do. So you don't know what he's doing, but so I understand why somebody would ask him, "What are you? What are you looking for?" But the, but the meeting of the person meeting him, rather than him meeting the person, is a little bit strange, right? Yeah. And he says, "I'm looking for my brother." Mm -hmm. Another problem. Does Yosef have any reason to believe that he, this man, would know what he's talking about? I'm looking for my brothers. You know my brothers? Uh, you stranger. You know my brothers? I mean, I'm, uh, he's gone to Shechem from Hebron. And he said, somebody asked him, what are you looking for? He said, my brothers. So what am I supposed to do to help you find your brothers? I mean, brothers? Well, who? They, he might ask them, what do your brothers look like? Uh, yeah. uh, what is their name? How many brothers did you do? Uh -huh. are you looking for? Uh, what were they doing, these brothers, that you're looking for? I mean, you you're want me to identify? So. So usually, Yosef would say to somebody, you know, listen, you're asking me what I'm looking for? I'm looking for a bunch of men, ten, it so happens, ten men, who happen to be my brothers, and, they're, and they have a lot of flocks of sheep. Did you see anything like that? He doesn't say that. He, it's, oh, as though, it's as though he assumes, he assumes this man who no. found him, asks him what he wants, and he says, I'm looking for my brothers. And he says, Hagida nali, eifo heim roim. 
tell me where they are shepherding. Now, how would this man know where they're shepherding? Exactly. Why would he suggest? So, again, do, do close reading of the text suggest that there's something Yosef expects this man who just came out of nowhere to bring him some kind of guidance? Right. And that's what, again, I mean, so I, I don't say it's obvious it's an, it's an angel, but the people, the reason some of the Mepharshim see something mysterious under the text here, sort of going on here, not the usual meeting of a man, is suggested by some of the hints in the Mepharshim, right? To say, obviously, it's an angel, who knows what, right? I mean, but, and by Yomer Ha'ish, and the man says, Nasu Mizel, they, they went away from here, Kishamati, because I heard them say, let's go Doitaina, he even knows the town, right? I heard them say, that, let's go to that town. Now, what are the chances of the man knowing that he's looking for that particular group and having overheard a conversation? There's a you know, ten men with flocks, and there's a man, some man, and he hears them speaking to each other and says, "Oh, there's no grass over here. Let's go to Doitan." Well, what are the chances of that? Mm -hmm. You know. And then he happens to meet this guy and asks him what he's doing. He says, "I'm looking for my brothers." Oh, that must be the people that I heard say, "Hey, go time, you go there." Right, it's a little bit too but much coincidental, too strange. It was uh, Yosef must have felt up to the very fact that his father sent him to his brothers, who he knows uh, he hated. That's enough um, to, 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 to um, make any, any surprise in that. There are a lot of surprises. One of the Mepharshim who says, I'm looking for my brothers, suggests that Yosef was hoping to make reconciliation. To reconciliation, that they would see that he's left home and he's come to, they went to shepherding and Yosef didn't. What's Yosef doing at home? So they probably didn't even want him, you know, I mean, let's, we're going shepherding. And they go, so he's left at home, and he mopes, and he sees, I mean, you know, they're not, we're not friendly. There's something wrong here, right? So when his father says it, he said, go to your brothers. Some of us say, Yosef, Yaakov was hoping. I mean, why does he need to hear news from, from the ten people who went? He's going to send one person to find out how they are, so he's going to bring them back news. I mean, okay, maybe it's possible, but some people say that Yaakov knew that the boys didn't get along together. So he says, go to your brothers and bring me these things, yeah. right? To hang out with them a little bit. It, might, be, it might do some good, they right? Went and he says that the Chayanim of Akesh, they went, of course, thinking that they're going to get rid of him, but he was hoping that he's going to make some kind of reconciliation. Okay. Say, All right? I say they, they went to Shechem to make a moon and to pray for the plague. <laughs> okay. So... So he, he talks about who is this man, right? Mm -hmm. He claims it's Gabriel, mm -hmm. whom God sent. Um, and did the brothers know about the snakes in the, in the pit? Well, okay. Remember, they put him in a pit. And Reuben said to him, why kill him? Put him in the pit, right? So if they know that there's snakes and scorpions there, putting him in the pit is the same as killing him, no? So the Ramban thinks that they probably did not know that there were snakes and scorpions. They thought it was the pit. So he'll be there alone, you know what I mean? But not that they would kill him by putting yeah, him in the What is the reason to put him in, into the sea and know... That's Ruben's motivation. Yeah. But why do they agree? What's the idea? So he says, don't you spill his blood. I mean, he's going to die. We're, we're, I'm with you. I'm with you, Ruben is suggesting, right? Uh, he, we should kill our brothers. But, well, I mean, to take our own hands and stab him to death is not, not polite. <laughs> let's, put him into, let's put him into the pit. You guys, you know, put him into the pit. He'll die there, and you won't have to be the ones who actually <laughs> kill him. Crime in second degree. Yeah, it's a pretty cheap 
kind of excuse, right? Mm -hmm. But he has to pretend that he's with the brothers because otherwise they would uh, kill him or they would uh, not listen to him, right? So he wants to convince them in a way that they might go along with him. He has a secret motivation that he's going to come by later on after the brothers are gone. He's going to pull them out and he's going to save them, take them back to his brothers. He always says that, right? Mm -hmm. But it seems clear to the Ramban that, you know, there's a Midrash that this pit was full of snakes. So uh, why they say that, I don't know. We'll see in a minute. But yeah, because Reuben was expecting to, to find him after, after his death. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he obviously thought that could be for a moment, not forever. That it was safe. Exactly. There. Yeah. Right? So didn't I tell you once? Pinky, didn't I tell you once the opinion of the Orachayim? There's a Mefarish before we go to Ramban. The Ramban feels it's impossible. Eliyahu agrees with the Ramban. Impossible that they would know that this thing was writhing with snakes on the bottom of the pit because then Ruvain would not have suggested that they put him in the pit yeah. if he wants to save his life. Correct? Uh, Makes sense. Yes. So Orachaim suggests he has a different answer. This is, not a, this is not a pit in the middle of an inhabited area that he's always going to be able to get help. He'll never get help here because it's all by himself, right? Ki ain't over There's no, there's no wayfarers. There's no the travelers here. The sitera katu ki hayareik ve'in bo mayim. And the pasuk says the pit was empty without water. Shima ya bo mayim lo yad biuto shikvar milo shukuminuz yuchotam. If there was water like a well, you don't throw somebody into the water if you're not if you're not going to spill blood. You, if you throw him into the water, he's going to he's yeah. going to drown. So it can't be that, right? Okay. Right? Now, the Katab Rashi, now he's bringing up. Katab Rashi, mi mashma shene'emar habor reik, eno yodea she'en bo mayim. Rashi is quoting a Achmetot, I think. Right? That the Torah says, the pit is empty, empty, it doesn't have water. Now, isn't it obvious if it's empty, it doesn't have water? Do you have to tell me it doesn't have water? So he says, ma talmud lomar e'en bo mayim. What does it mean? Why do you have to tell me there's no water? It had no water, but it had something else. That's what the pit is empty of water, but it's not empty of other things, like scorpions and snakes. Mm -hmm. Okay? Lashon Rashi Midirabotenu. And that's Rashi who's quoting a Gemara and Shabbos. Okay. Being Cain, if that's the case, Hayunu Hashim Vakarim Bechorei Habor. So, therefore, if you want to agree with that Gemara, right, then you have to agree with that Gemara that they didn't know. The Torah is just telling you that the pit was empty and it, di it didn't have water, but it had, pit it had snakes. But you have to assume, Pinky, yes. right, you have to assume that there were snakes there, there were snakes in the holes, in the, in the little cr nooks and crannies in them. Mm -hmm. Or if it was so deep, that the Torah is telling us there's snakes there, but they couldn't see the snakes. Because if they saw the snakes, they wouldn't, what he'll say, they wouldn't hurt him directly by throwing him on top of the snakes. Because if they would put him in the pit, and he would still be alive when we got down to the pit, and they saw snakes there, they would say, oh my goodness, we took a holy man who's got a miraculous way of surviving, and obviously God is on his side if he sees... Yeah. It would be the same as if they would try to kill him and the, and the knife would be turned into rubber. Right? If you take a man and you throw him into a pit full of snakes and nothing happens to him, right? Then it's impossible for them to just believe that they, oh, fine, we're happy now. Well, we got rid of him. We got rid of a miraculous thing, right? So it can't be, right? Um, right. And then they would know that his Merit has saved him, we call Ra from all evil. How could they then hurt a man who was chosen by God? That God has chosen him to save him. This is, I think, from Daniel, right? Yes. Yeah. 
Um, uh, God sent an angel and closed the mouth of the of the lions, and they did not uh, harm them because marriage was found for me. To yeah, because marriage was found and and uh, it stood in my side in in my stead. But they did not know about the snakes. It can't be that they would know. That there's no water at all. He says you don't have to read into the text what Rashi said. When a boar is rake, ain't bomain at all, not even a little. Something like that is what's meant for this. Shagam imayuba mein meat ikare rak rake. Even though there would be a little water, it could still be called empty. There are other psukim like that. You will die and not live. Not even for a little bit. A little bit, right? That's only a, an emphasis. How empty it was. So he doesn't, he doesn't go for the idea, according to Pshat, he doesn't go for the idea that there were snakes in there anyway, but even if there were snakes, it couldn't be with their knowledge. Right? right. Now, by the way, the Orachayim, Orachayim is a little difficult, according to Ramban. See, Orachayim says he, Ruvain, knew that there were snakes there, and he didn't care because he knew that God would save him when it comes to nature. But what about the brothers? According to the Ramban, the brothers would not be able to know, for the story to make sense, the brothers wouldn't know that there was snakes there. Right? Because they would see him saved, or they would know that they're killing him anyway. So he... The Ramban doesn't think it's reasonable for them to be aware that there are poisonous snakes there. But who must, who must be aware? The brothers. Uh, His brother, well, not Ruben. Well, they uh, <coughs> assume that he will be killed by snakes. Uh-huh. Yeah, but his, but his, his claim is that if they knew that, oh, and they threw him in, then they would look in there and they would say, ha, 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 he's going to get killed now. And then they would watch him sit there with the snakes walking around him, not doing anything to him. So he's claiming that would show them mm -hmm. that he is chosen by God to save him. And that wouldn't have been, mm -hmm. the story wouldn't have ended that way. They would have all repented. They would have pulled him yeah, out. They, they, didn't, they didn't see. They didn't look at him. They didn't see what happened to him. They just threw him and they walked away. Immediately. And then they went back to where, where imagining, right? imagining that he would get killed right away, and they're not interested in looking. Yeah, right. Oh, oh, oh. The Torah doesn't say that he was crying out, he was yelling out. He was crying to them. Remember, Ruben also said, you remember when he was there, and he was crying to us, and you didn't go to save him, and you didn't go to take care of him? So, wait, were you crying because the snakes were eating him up? He was crying. I don't know. The story, I mean, back in Mitzrayim, the story seems to suggest that nothing was happening in the boar except that he felt, brothers, brothers, let me out, let me out, don't do this to me, why should you to put me in the pit, to save me, take me back to my father, take me, I'm your brother, right? I mean, I, that sounds like that's what he was saying. The, the way the story seems to be reasonable, right? And Ruben is reminding them about that, that they were mean to him and they didn't listen So he's, he's questioning. Now, of course, if you are a child who went to Hebrew school when you were three or four years old and they told you the stories of the Bible, then you know very well that there were snakes and scorpions there, right? I mean, Vinky, don't you know that from the time you were four? Um, four? Yeah, about. <laughs> Didn't they tell you the stories of the Parsha when you were a little kid? And I'm sure they would have told you, number one, that this was an angel that he met, Yosef met in Shechem. Yeah. That's why it was obvious that it was an angel. Right. And, that, and that they also told you they put him in a pit full of snakes and scorpions, and God made a miracle that he wasn't bitten. Isn't that what they told you when you were four? Remember. Well, of course they don't remember. But it's true. If you ask a kid in the street today, Shabbos, let's go out, and if there are any children in shul, you can ask them what was in the pit. They'll tell you snakes and scorpions, right? Because Rashi is the famous one. And the Ramban uh, mm, yeah. takes a little more sophistication towards the Ramban. Okay. All right. So, so what are we, where, where are his brothers now? They went. 
They were in Dotan. No, no, no. Oh. Yeah, I was a kid. Oh, they're, they're sitting having lunch. Yeah. Right. They're sitting having lunch. They put him into the pit. And they went to eat. And they went to eat. And, and, and they, they got him undressed. They took him undressed from that Kutonet Pasim, that, that uh, cursed... Uh, that cursed uh, clothing that his father gave him, that special, special thing, right? Yeah. And they took him and put him in the pit, and it has no water, and they sat to eat bread. Yeah. Nearby. Yeah. By Yisu and Ahem, and they see, and there's a caravan of uh, Ishmaelite uh, traders coming from Gilad with their camels carrying all kinds of spices. spices. And they're going to Mitzrayim, to, to, it's, it's a trade route, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. right, to Mitzrayim. And Yehuda says to his brothers, what uh, point is there for us to cause his, to kill him, right? He, you know, now he's talking about killing, not directly. Anyway, they're not going to stab him, right? But why should we go and, 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 and uh, cause his death of our brother? And then we're going to have to somehow hide, cover, it up, cover up his blood. Let's go instead. Now there's another plan, right? Put him in the pit means he's going to die beforehand. Mm -hmm. Now he says, well, Yudah says, well, you know what? We can get rid of him in a different way. Let's sell him to these Ishmaelites. And we, our own hands will not have caused anything. Because he is, after all, our brother and our flesh. Right. Now that's quite an argument he would give to them because remember he's trying to he's among those who hated him also and he has to convince them to go along with him mm -hmm. right so similar to Reuven who is afraid of what they're going to react does Yehuda really want to get rid of him or does he want to save him well he can't be like Reuven thinking he's going to bring him back to his father because if they sell him to the Ishmaelites and he go to Mitzrayim you'll never see him again so he just wants to be a little more innocent and not cause his death. Let's cause him to be slave. He thought that he was going to be a king. He thought he was going to be ruling over us and we would bow down to him. Well, let's see what happens to those dreams now. And he sends him to, as a slave. I mean, a slave doesn't ever get to be a king. That's not normal, right? So let's do that. But at least we don't have to kill him in order to ruin his dreams. And we don't have to kill him in order to have his father not spoil him anymore instead of us we'll get rid of him don't have to kill him you could sell him right but he can't be as good as Ruben. Ruben had a plan right Ruben had a plan he was hoping he would stay in the pit right so no, what's no, happening no, to no, Ruben in the meantime no, no, no. he was hoping he'd stay in the pit so he can come and get him yeah. but you can't go and get him if he's going to be sold to the Ishmaelites no, right. anymore right but where is Ruben, Ruben now oh uh, now so what's going on with Ruben what, is Ruben part of this conversation? To sell him? He's part of the conversation. Yehuda speaks to the brothers. Is he speaking to Ruben also? Looks like uh, not. Because, he, because he, 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 Ruben would say, no, 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 keep him in the pit. I don't want to sell him. Or, I mean, hey, something. I mean, because his plan was to use the pit as the way to right. save him. So now if he sell him, my plan is gone. So what is he doing here? Where is he? What, what is going? So the Mepharshim have trouble with that, right? Yeah. And and as soon as Yehuda says this to them, so is Reuben eating lunch with them? And is Reuben part of the meal? Mm. The Torah doesn't say, one way or the other. And there were, while, remember, there's Ishmaelites, and now there's Midianites. Mm -hmm. So the brothers are sitting eating lunch over here on the hillside, and there's a pit over there. They look down over there, there's a road, and coming camels, and they see them coming closer, and they say, Ishmaelites are coming. Yehuda says, you know what, I have a plan. Let's sell them to those Ishmaelites. While, the Torah then says, and Midianites came, and they pulled them out of the pit, and they took them to Mitzrayim. What about the plan to sell them to the Ishmaelites? The Ishmaelites. What happened? So some people explain, maybe the Ramban, yeah, the Ramban probably will say, so are they the same people? And they sold him? It doesn't say they sold him, remember? They you look at the next sentence, and them. there were people from Midian who were merchants, came by, and they pulled the pit, they pulled Yosef out of the pit. Who did? They did, right? It seems like. 
But it then says, they, whoever they, pull Yishma, y- Yosef out of the pit, Vayimkiru at Yosef to the Ishmaelites. And they sold him, Yosef, to the Ishmaelites. Midianites sold him to the Ishmaelites. Besrim Kesef. And they brought Yosef to Mitzrayim. So if you look at that literally, Yehuda and his brothers are sitting, eating lunch, and they're waiting for the Ishmaelites to come because they see them from afar, and they have a plan to sell them. In the meantime, behind them is the pit, right? And on the other part of the road, come, without, they didn't see them, come Ishmaelites. They were sitting a little farther away because it spoils your appetite to hear somebody crying. You can't eat such very good food, ice cream and, uh, and steak while somebody's crying. Save me, save me, take me out of the pit. You're my brother, save me. So, you know, I don't like to hear this. Let's go over there on the other side of the hill so we won't hear him scream, screaming so much, right? So try to make this movie, you know? They don't want to... So they are eating there, right? It could be that Ruvain said, you know, I don't have an appetite. I don't think I want to eat. I think I'm going to go take a walk. And it could be that he wasn't eating with them when Yehuda says, let's sell him to Ishmaelites. I mean, I'm just suggesting it's possible, right? Think, mm-hmm. right? So Yehuda is sitting there planning, and he sees the Ishmaelites coming ahead from them. In the meantime, behind the hill, there's the pit, and Yosef is crying, and come Midianites, merchants, who are closer by, but the brothers didn't see them, right? And they hear the sound of this boy. Uh, let's go see what's going on. They go to the pit, and they only see the pit, and they only see one boy. They don't see the brothers. Because mm-hmm. they, right, if they saw the brothers, they wouldn't be able to get away with uh, just pulling them out of the pit, right? Mm-hmm. Because the brothers would say, hey, you owe, some, you owe us some money. I mean, uh, you can't just take that guy. He's ours. Mm-hmm. He, they were going to sell him. Mm-hmm. So the Emilianites sneak him quietly out of the pit, and they put him in a, ba- in a, in a cloth bag or in a box, and they start going on the road. They go on the road and they meet the Ishmaelites that the brothers that Yehuda was seeing coming from there. So they meet them and they say, you know, if you're a kidnapper, if you're a kidnapper, you want to get rid of the goods as soon as you can, right? I mean, you steal some jewelry, you don't keep the jewelry in your pocket because the police might catch you and somebody's going to run after you. So you know what? You sell it to somebody else, get some money, and you're out of the picture. Let him take care of uh, what he's going to do. Right? So the Soharim, these merchants, they're not interested in taking him all the way to Mitzrayim. They see somebody else, Ishmaelites, oh, where are you going? You're going to Mitzrayim? Hey, we got a nice piece of, uh, of merchandise here for you. You want to see this slave? He looks like a nice kid. You want to buy him? So they sell it to him, to them. And the Ishmaelites take him to Mitzrayim. Which means, according to this story, that the 20 pieces of silver went from the Ishmaelites to the Midianites. No, that the boys no. never got anything. They never got never money. got anything. But they say let us sell him. To let, the let, let's try. Let's sell him to the Ishmaelites. Exactly. But here it says the Midianites yes. came, took him out, and sold him to the Midian to the Ishmaelites. That's one way of telling the story. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's one way of telling the story. But in that case, it would mean that the brothers did not sell did not. their brother. To slavery. That's the that's here. Right. If that's the story. Yeah. I was wondering what what they do, what what why they they did with the with the money. That what happens at the not, end? What happens at the end? Well, of course, what do they do with the, what happens at the end when Yosef meets his brothers? I mean um, and he says um, and he says, Don't be angry, don't feel bad. Where is it? Well, there's a midrash that says um, he sold his, his brother, sold him for uh, shoes. That's the problem. That's right. I mean, it, it, this story would make a very big surprise because of the assumption that the brothers sold him and they took 20 pieces of silver. It's happened. There's a midrash, you remember, that just Asara Harugay Malchut, the 10 people who were killed by this king, he said, I know from your tradition that your forefathers sold their brother to slavery and therefore you are responsible to be punished for them and therefore the ten of you rabbis are going to be killed. So there's an assumption. Um, where is it? 
Where is he? Where is he? He said, oh, and I want you to know, he says to his brothers, when he finally tells them, I am your brother Yosef, in Mitzrayim, right? He surprises them. Here I am, right? Now don't be, don't feel bad when you go back to my father to tell him that I'm alive. Don't start arguing with each other on the road. Mm-hmm. Don't feel bad that you sold me here. Because you, it only happens that this has saved our lives and God had this plan and so on and so on and so on. But right? they never saw He said, don't, but according to the story, how could he say, don't feel bad you sold me here. Mm-hmm. You sold me. So according to this story, you would say, you were caught, don't feel bad that you caused me to be sold. I mean, you put me in the pit, you looked away for a while, somebody took me and sold me to somebody else. It's as good as you sold me. You know, you caused my slavery. So don't feel bad about that because it was God's plan. That's one way. But literally speaking, he's saying you sold me, and it really isn't true that they sold him directly with their own hands. Right? Mm-hmm. You can get away with it, but the text suggests that there's a, the actual set. So some people, you'll see the Ramban believes that the Midianites and the Ishmaelites are the same people. They just have a different label. And the story is, the brothers are there, they see the Ishmaelites coming, and when they do come, the Ishmaelites, Midianites, same people, come, and they pull them out of the pit, meaning they, the brothers, pull them out of the pit, and they sell him to these Ishmaelites. Now, why would the Torah use two different names for the same people in the same yeah. sentence is a little bit difficult. Yes, right? I, I don't believe that. that right? it's, a, it's a little bit of an issue. It's a little the, bit of an the issue. The Midianite that the Torah is telling us is Midianite, so something is, is mean, cooking uh, on. Hmm? What do you want to suggest? I, I don't know, but why, um, why is the Torah mixing up Ishmaelim and what, if this is the way to do to answer the question, why would the Torah use that? That's the question. Why would the Torah tell you the same people twice in two different names in the same sentence? Mm-hmm. So they're different people, definitely. So here comes Ishmaelites coming to them. Pasuk 24, 25. Right. right? When they lift up their eyes. And they saw from afar, right, people coming from Gilad, right? Yes. Hikiru, they recognized from far away that these are Ishmaelites mm-hmm. because of the camels. Mm-hmm. Ishmaelites have camels, okay? And they knew that they would be on the route. Gilad is a little north. They're going down, so they must be going to Mitzrayim, Okay. Yuvan, uh, uh, oh, and they knew that from Gilead comes this spices. If you remember, there's a there's a pasuk in uh, one of the prophets. Is it uh, Malachi? Is there no spices in Gilad? Meaning, you know, is is there no wonderful aroma mm-hmm. of the Jews in Israel anymore? God is saying, lamenting, is there no righteousness here? Is there no spices here? You know, in Gilad. Okay. Mm-hmm. And they knew that people taking spices are going to Egypt because that's a good market. So Judah says to them, these are people who are going from a long, far away, and they're going to a far away. Right? I mean, when, when you want to sell somebody who's your brother, you don't want to sell him to somebody who is close by, here, going even if he's going far away, because he's going to come back home, and people are going to start searching for this guy. Did, did anybody hear about somebody coming? So the people who are living here would know something about this. Right? But Yehuda is saying, listen, these are people from France who are going to Egypt, and we're sitting in the middle of the Middle East. You know, we can get rid of him very quickly. Because nobody will know who they were, and nobody will know where they're going. He'll disappear. You understand? Mm-hmm. Which is far away? Which is far away? Is there uh, Ishmael? Well, Ishmaelites, I don't know. Ishmaelites, I thought, lived near Mitzrayim. But um, I don't know. I don't know. 
Yeah. Right, Midian, Midian is near, oh. uh, near, near Edom, somewhere. Anyway, okay. The kasher karvu lahem matzu ki hayu ba'alei schora asher lahem hanachri hanachat varatri. When they came closer, they saw that these were merchants who had this spices. Anashim midyanim socharim. Right. Shesachru agamlin yeshalim. So here's the way the Ramban solves the problem with the two people. The brothers see camels coming from far away. They don't know who they are, right? And they're coming from Gilead. They're going with spices. They see that they've got these things that they're going down south. They must, they must be Ishmaelites because they have camels, and they must be going to Mitzrayim. Let's sell them to him. When the people came closer, that's only when they were far away, they looked like that. When they were coming closer, they saw that we, it was, they're not Ishmaelites, they're Midianites. Uh, they're no. Midianites. And they must have taken camels from the Midian. After all, somebody who's driving a, a Cadillac doesn't mean that he's a Cadillac dealer. He got a Cadillac somewhere. No. You know? What do you mean, no? And that's what the Ramban says. The Kasher Karvu. Do you see that? I mean, obviously you can argue with them about the likelihood of this, right? When they were far away, they thought that they were Ishmaelites. The Kasher Karvu lahem matzu ki hayu ba'alei schora asher lahem anachot v'akri v'hanashim midyanim sokharim. Indeed. They rented these uh, these camels. It's not their camels. They're 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 Ishmaelite camels, but they're not. But they're mm -hmm. yeah, if you look at the camels today, you know they have this um, like the Indians in the, in America in the Wild West. You could see what kind of uh, cloth they had on their horses. You could tell which tribe they are. Mm -hmm. Right. So these are camels which you could identify as Ishmaelite people owned these camels. But when they came closer, they saw those are not Ishmaelites. They're riding on these camels, but they look like they're merchants who come from Midian. I suppose you could tell if I lived in those days. You could tell who's who. But they must have gotten these camels from Ishmaelites to do business, right? So, so the boys, the brothers, take Yosef and they sell him to these business people who are Midianites, who are riding Ishmaelite camels. You got there, it? There is some, another, another place in the Torah well, where you can. Well, you can't wait that with Yosef. Wait. Yeah, right now. Midianites get Yosef. Right, but if we have. They're business people. We have an, another place in the Torah when this confusion may clear something. I don't know. I don't know. I don't remember any, any kind of. I don't know. Right? And they buy him to do business. Ki yachata ishmaelim maspirei agmalim. Ishmaelite um, caravan who who rent camels out to people will not buy mer you know merchandise for themselves. The Amar So the 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 Midianites who are on the Ishmaelites camels rented from the Ishmaelites, took Yosef, bought him for 20 silvers from the brothers, from the brothers, we're back into the same tradition now that the brothers sold him. They, the, Ish, the, the, um, the, uh, the Midianites, return the camels to the Ishmaelites that they rented from them. They're doing business locally in the place, right? They, got they return the Ishmaelites, and while they're at it, they say, here, you, you pay us a little bit of extra or don't charge us rent for one of the camels. We'll give you this slave that we just got. Right? They can make a little, a little exchange. And now the Ishmaelites end up with Yosef from the Midianites, who bought it from Yosef's brothers. Bought him from Yosef's brothers. That's the way the Ramban tries to figure out how the sentences make so complex. Mm -hmm. But now the guilt of the direct sale of the brothers is in the hands of Yehuda. Of the brothers, of Yehuda and his brother, who sold Yosef directly, right? The other version was that it happened while they were looking away between the two groups. How did they, how did they, how did they get back into their hands? Who? How did Yosef get back into the hands of, of, of the brothers? I mean, it was in the pit. It was in the pit. It was in the pit. The brothers, when they see this Chorim Midianites, 
They say, here's our chance to sell them. They go. The brothers go to the pit, pull Yosef out of the pit, and give them to the Midianite people who sold them later to the Ishmaelites. That all happens in one second. Because the Torah calls them Midianites and Ishmaelites. It must be some meaning that they travel to Mitzrayim. The Ishmaelites travel to Mitzrayim. Whoever, whoever. The Ishmaelites traveled to Mitzrayim. Ishmael, you remember, was married to an Egyptian princess, so I guess they have a connection with Egypt. Mm -hmm. Midianites are more local merchants. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I mean, you have a problem. Yeah. You do have a problem. It's not the Ramban who made up the problem. The problem is the Pasuk in the Torah. Well. The Huda says, let's sell them. They see, media, they see Ishmaelites from, from a distance saying, here come Ishmaelites, let's sell them to the brothers. Let's sell our brothers to, him, to them. Mm -hmm. Then, the next pasuk is the mysterious pasuk. And behold, here come Midianites merchants, and they pull Yosef out of the pit, and they sell him to the Ishmaelites. One pasuk, that's what the pasuk says. How do you, how do you figure what happened? Yehuda so, planned to sell him to Ishmaelites. Then the Pasuk, in, without interruption, the Pasuk say, and here, behold, Midianite merchants come, they pull him out of the pit. Who? They, they don't know who they, right? They throw him out of the pit, and they zoom to the Ishmaelites. So the story I told you before is plain. The brothers don't see what's going on. While they're hoping for the Ishmaelites to come to sell him, the, the Midianites sneak up on this pit. The Midianites pull him out of the pit. The Midianites take him, and the Midianites sell him to the Ishmaelim that the brothers were hoping to sell him to. So they never, the brothers never sold him to. They just, they caused his sale because they put him in the pit and they didn't protect him and he was picked up by the... I mean, they, I mean, I mean, they never good. got any money. Okay. Never got the money. But that doesn't work exactly with some of the texts, like you didn't, you sold me, and so on and so on, where he says that to his brothers. So you can get away with it by making some kind of amendments to the way it means, right? But if you don't do that, and you want to say the brothers did sell him, how do you figure this pasuk? So you have to say, Midianites come, meaning the Ramban says they realize that what they thought was Ishmaelites from a distance are really Midianites. And they, the brothers, say, that's fine, let's sell them to whoever we want to sell them to. They, the brothers, they, brothers, pulled them out of the pit. Hey, they, they're the ones who schlepped them out of the pit. Sell them to these immediate people without waiting for the Ishmaelites to come. And they, the Midianites, take them, eventually sell them to the Ishmaelites themselves. And he goes to Mitzrayim with the Ishmaelites. I mean, what, I mean that's, it, it's difficult, it's difficult. Either way, it's a kind of a convoluted story. Yeah, it's, not, it's a problem, whichever way you go. Which would you like? I mean, well, you have to have a story. The Torah has a pasuk. The pasuk is enigmatic. So everybody's trying to figure out what the pasuk means. There's two ways. So therefore, we know that the Ishmaelites were the ones who actually got him to Mitzrayim. Because there is a Pasuk, Miyad Ha Ishmaelim, Asher Hu Idu Shama 53. Pasuk 53 actually says in, in Perik Lamed Tet Aleph, when they finally go to Mitzrayim, where is it? Lamed Tet Aleph, Vet Achichem Kachu Vekhutarem, Veel Shalom. Where is it? Tet is on the tet. To get the answer to the... Uh, what perik? Well, the, the, the Ramban is trying to tell us that we know the Ishmaelites are the ones who actually got into the tribe. Uh, to get to the answer to the, to the some surprise there too. Um, Oh my goodness. And and in fact, there's a Pasuk 54 that says the Midianites sold him to Mitzrayim. To the Egyptians. 
to the Egyptians, and that, according to this, would be not true because they took him to the Ishmaelites. So he says, well, they're the ones who eventually, you know, because of their sale, they got him to Mitzrayim that way. Yeah, 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 yeah. We know so, there was three, three, three sevens. Yeah, so some people, tell, some people tell the story, he says, the Torah sometimes tells the story directly, and, some people, and sometimes the Torah tells the story as this is the person who started the process of what ended up in Mitzrayim. Right? They say sometimes about what oh. God did that actually Moshe did. But no, all right, all right. There are other examples of people being ascribed, the action is ascribed to a person who really set the ball motion. Yeah, so the Uben Ezra says that they're both uh, all one and the same. So why the Torah? They, and he says it, it can't be that because because ki heim. The year 62. That, so there is, uh, in Shoftim, there are ways of recognizing the difference between Yishmaelites and, and uh, Midianites. Okay. Some people say, he say in the end here, that they were sold many, that Yosef was sold many times. Whatever happened here, he was taken, you know, it's many hundreds of miles to get to Mitzrayim. Mm -hmm. So in the meantime, you know, he's crying, and they're carrying him, and they have to feed him to keep him alive. So uh, they, they see, really they see another them. set of merchants, so they sell him. We got a nice kid. Yeah, why don't they go, give, us, give us $20? And they do from hand to hand to hand until he gets to Mitzrayim. That's one way of saying it also. It's just telling you that there was a whole evolution of sales. Mm -hmm. Right. Some people say it once or they're all one and the same, but then why weren't the pasuk mentioned two of them in the same two names in the same pasuk? It's kind of hard to say the Ibn Ezra's idea. Anyway, the two favorite stories are the Rabbans and whoever the other one is, but they, they never sold him. Yeah, the they just the caused his sale. A question to the main So if Joseph is going to Egypt, you know, now these brothers, his brothers that he's gonna be alive or whatever. Why they, the brothers, uh, took the, the tunic and go to his father uh, with uh, blood spilling on his... Why, why didn't he say, we don't know. Yeah, they could come we home. We don't need it. We don't need him. Well, no, don't you think maybe, I mean, you, you understand the question, right? Mm -hmm. They can go home and they, and they could say, make believe they never met Yosef. Oh. Yaakov says, oh, you're home. What happened to your brother? So, what brother? We never saw his, our brother. Uh -huh. Right. And he'd never come back. Mm -hmm. And that would be that. Mm -hmm. So what did he get? He get had him because he, uh, he, he, uh, he uh, cursed him by giving his first passing to Yosef. Yeah. So that's why they had to stick it to him. Understand? He's trying to say that they are very sadistic. Because they were angry with the father. They were angry with the father for oh, having yes. loved Yosef more and giving him this kotonet pasim. Yeah, but so they, they came they, in and they brought him this kotonet pasim with the blood on it, and it says, "Ah, you know, uh, you recognize this." But but they they are saying that we we hate all about all all of us. We are hating these people. We all. They didn't, they didn't say 